very surprised that Ken Burns hadn't gotten hold of the American Revolution and, and did it.
view the door at the end of the hall and around a few different way. Uh, walk on down the hall. The notice outside the walls here are the comprehensives from the artist when they started doing the murals. So uh, enjoy that. Tonight I'll talk about how to get out to the uh, Silver Lake Plantation trophy room after the second presentation. But that's at 6 o'clock tonight, so it will be light. If it's not raining too hard and we can find a clear field of fire, so park. We'll talk about parking. Pay attention where you park, so we don't blow out your windshield when we shoot the cannon. <coughs> Tomorrow, if you sleep in, and you miss the first presentation. If you're not here on the bus at 9:25, we'll see you in the afternoon when we get back because the timing is really critical on the bus tour. We have to be rolling out of the parking lot at 9:25. Okay, overall, listen, we want to have fun. We try to recognize some of the important people in the room, like the esteemed Dr. Joe Stoops, probably the most senior and real historian in the room. Senior, that means old. <laughs> <laughs> and we also are happy to have, you know, we have a Francis Marion Trail Commission now in the state. And we're happy to have the executive director, Bob Barrett, with us this afternoon. And during the thing, when I think about it, I'll introduce some of the noteworthy historians uh, that are on the committee. Well, why don't I do it just now? Your, your first speaker is the world famous <laughs> Dr. Christine Slager, author of four, soon to be five books. She'll autograph them for you out there if you pay a small fee. And we're pleased to have her. She's on the committee. A renowned scholar from USC Sumter, Dr. Tom Powers, also a boo for being a backer town of Sumter. But, uh, and uh, I don't see Charles Baxley, but he'll be here sometime when you see him. He's the other one that's on the uh, uh, historic committee. Of, of the trail commission. So we're happy to have them here. Okay, if we get Brian Jarvis is going to be the MC coordinator. Like I said, he's also the ace reporter, so he's going to write it up. And if his article passes the test of the two Dr. Swaggers, we'll let him send it to Smoke and Fire for publication. That's a big F. And he comes from the western part of South Carolina, about halfway out to uh, the Pacific Ocean. So call it Missouri. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, and I want to uh, thank George for inviting me to be a part of the program today, but that is an honor. Uh, again, my name is Brian Jarvis, and I write for the Manning Times newspaper. I'm going to give just a very brief introduction, and then we'll get the program rolling. But one of the things that I love the most about my job has been the opportunity to not only learn about the Revolutionary War history in the county, but uh, the murals, the battle sites, uh, the reenactments, but also to write about it. And especially to write about it for younger generations. Uh, a lot of people grow up here, but have no idea of historical significance. And that history is very much alive today, and it stays alive in large part uh, due to the efforts of people like us in this room. And that said, I want to give you a warm welcome to uh, the fourth annual uh, Francis Barrett Symposium in Clarence County. Uh, we've got two uh, full days worth of festivities. Hope you'll be able to make uh, all of them or as much of them as you can. And uh, what else do I need to tell you? We will take breaks between the speakers, and you need restrooms around those doors and down the halls. And before I introduce our speaker, I just want to uh, give you one brief warning, which I've been given very strict instructions to stay on time. So it is uh, 10 minutes, I'll flash you a 10. Five minutes, I'll flash you a five. Then I think George's going to come up and call you off stage. <laughs> My husband does that too, and I don't pay any attention to him either. <laughs> well, I'm very grateful to have you here, so uh, don't uh, get it wrong. And our first speaker today uh, has written uh, books both for younger audiences and for general audiences. He's also a retired professor, a uh, newspaper columnist, a television commentator. I uh, here to uh, speak myself on many occasions, it's very good. And here today to talk about the Southern Campaign, uh, let me present Dr. Christine Swag. George, hope 
have, I hope it works. It doesn't? Okay, fine. Um, I am not a historian. I am a storyteller. And I wanted to tell the story of the Southern Campaign because I didn't learn it the way you people did. My ancestor was a Tory from New York who went to Canada. And I was born and raised in Canada. And I studied the American Revolution in a Canadian high school from a British textbook. And I knew how the British lost. And I came to the States to go to college and I took a course in American history and I discovered most Americans don't know how they won it. And I wanted to change that. I taught at USC and the teachers that I taught said somebody's got to write the story for us. And I figured it was about to time. Because I learned from a British textbook that the British lost the war in the South. Now if they lost it in the South, didn't the Americans win it in the South? And that's not the way your history's been presented to you. So I wanted to straighten out that. The Southern Camp, well, you might have noticed that the last big battle in the North was the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse in July of 1778. New Yorktown didn't happen until 81, three years later. That should have given somebody a clue that something was happening other than in New England. But evidently, <clears throat> they missed it. England had an impasse in the North. And they decided that they had to do something drastic to change the war. And they decided that they would take troops from the North, bring them down to the South, sweep up through the South, and the war would be won that way. The problem was, although the king thought it was a great idea, that the king was not a tyrant. He was a constitutional monarch, and that program had to be funded by Parliament. And Parliament had a lot of opposition. So how do you sell a new expensive campaign to people who wanted the war over and done with? And what did they do? What all politicians knew, they put it in the best possible light. New England had shippers and merchants, and so did they want. But they needed what was in the South. They had the greatest navy in the world of wooden ships. They needed timber, tar, turpentine, hemp. They needed the rice from the south to feed the slaves in the islands where the real wealth was in sugar, rum, and molasses. And so the pitch to Parliament was, we'll let New England go. They're in competition with us anyway, if we can keep the south. And that is how the Southern Campaign was funded by Parliament. We got to keep the South. And so Parliament was not going to spend any more money on this war after this. The war would have to be won or it would be lost in the South. And it almost worked. Because after Savannah fell, we had Charleston was taken and then we had outposts at Georgetown, Camden, 96 and Augusta, and Chirag early on. They expected the entire population to be loyalist and that they would rise up once the British troops came, join the British, and they would sweep up through the south. Now Clinton was in charge of, of this operation early on, and first he gave parole to people who had fought against him. And then he revoked the parole. And people who thought that they could go home and be neutral now knew they had to fight against their former friends. That caused a lot of difficulty. Clinton left, and he left Lord Cornwallis in charge. And he gave him two instructions. First, win the hearts and minds of the people. Back to loyalty to His Gracious Majesty King George III. And don't outrun your supply lines. And with that, Clinton went back to New York. The reason we don't have any more action in the North is Clinton thought that he had so many troops in the South that he had to keep a defensive position rather than an offensive position chasing 
George Washington about the North. And so Lord Cornwallis, who is determined to go to Virginia, moves and makes his headquarters in Camden. Now, he should have seen the handwriting on the wall because lots of people were not happy with the British. And there was tremendous opposition all through this area here and down into the, the new acquisition area early on, even before the Battle of Camden. And Cornwallis seemed to be oblivious to all of that. And he moves up first to uh, meet the uh, Continental Army that's moving down toward Camden. And he defeats that army. It was a terrible run. And now, Cornwallis must have thought that he had everything under control. But first, the hearts and minds of the people. Charles Baxley isn't here yet. He does not like me to say that Benaster Tarleton was a loose cannon. But Fortescue says he was, and Stokesbury says he was, and, uh, and I think he was. Um, the problems that he had um, uh, against the, the uh, atrocities against Hugh troops down at Monk's Corner and then up in the wax Oz would suggest that that was not the way to win the hearts and minds of the people of South Carolina. So already Cornwallis has violated one of his uh, rules. And now, after the Battle of Camden, Francis Marion goes into the swamps on this side of the Santee River. Once the British moved up and moved across the Santee at Nelson's Ferry, they were on this side of the Santee River, and Francis Marion was able to keep moving against that supply line. So even before Cornwallis left Camden to go to Charlotte, he was already in big trouble. But he evidently was oblivious to all of that, left Rodden in command here, and he went to Charlotte. Now, at Charlotte, he ran into more militia under Davis. There were just loads of people that didn't like Cornwallis. And as he is moving and, and is at Charlotte, he sends Patrick Ferguson out west. And Patrick Ferguson meets his end at Kings Mountain because the backcountry militia surround him at Kings Mountain and they wake him off. And then, Cornwallis realizes his western flank is exposed to all of these yelling boys that he called out that militia. He moves back to Winsboro. I think that he believed that he was going to have a winter camp, but he didn't know that South Carolina doesn't have very many snow days. And the war continued because he did not get any rest. And while he is here, we have Blackstock's up in this area, and Thomas Sumter inflicts almost 100 casualties on him there. And then we've got Nathaniel Green who comes down and takes over the command of the Southern Army. I think that Nathaniel Green is probably the brightest man of the Revolution with the exception of Benjamin Franklin. And of course we all love that old retrovet. But he moves into Charlotte and he splits his troops. And he moves over to the Shira area, which had to be evacuated by the British because the 71st Highlanders got so sick they had to uh, depart from that area. He moves over here and he sends Daniel Morgan over to the west. Now, Stokesbury, who is a history professor at Acadia University in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, writes that. Um, Cornwallis sent Tarleton out to counter Morgan. And Stokesbury writes, for 10 days in early January, Tarleton first looked for and then chased Morgan, whom he outnumbered two to one. On January 17, he made the mistake of catching him. And you all know what happened at Tarleton. Uh, Daniel Morgan defeated uh, the for Tarleton. Now we have the race to the dam. Now, if you people like stories like I do, and if you like biblical stories like the 
flight of the Israelites out of Egypt in Exodus, you'll love the race to the van. It just appeared that Providence always was on the side of Morgan. Morgan is moving up with about 600 prisoners to get them to Virginia. <coughs> Green moves over to join him. Light Horse Harry Lee, who's been down here with Francis Marion, he moves up and enjoys, uh, joins them. And there's this mad rush. Cornwallis, wanting to move faster, burns his baggage at Ramsar's Mill. His tents, his extra uniforms, and he keeps only medical supplies and a little rum. Isn't that right? Uh, a little wrong, and uh, attempts to catch the Americans, and he never does. They get their prisoners up, and those prisoners will stay over two years in Port, uh, port Security in York, Pennsylvania. Now, Cornwallis is hurting. The shoes are worn out, the uniforms are running, are getting a little thin, and it's winter in North Carolina. Now, he'd never been in the South before. He probably thought everything south of Virginia was tropical. But anyway, uh, he's in serious trouble. Green knows that he's got to defeat Cornwallis at some time or other. And he moves back into North Carolina, and they meet at Guilford Courthouse. In a bloody battle, Green leaves It's not bad. killed or seriously wounded. 
and most of those would die before they got up to Widow Wellington. Green knows that the British are going to have to quit. They cannot continue to take these kinds of casualties, and certainly the British government is not going to support this war much longer. But international law will give England everything they hold when hostilities end. It was international law at the time. It's called Utah Pacificus. What you hold, you keep. And if the war had ended then, England would have kept North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And so Green makes the decision not to follow Cornwallis, but he will turn south and take back the territory. Up until now, he just wanted to pile up the British bodies. Now he wants to take back territory. And he, the way he's going to do it, he will attack with his continentals the big folks, like Camden in 96, and he will depend on the militia to take back the smaller posts. And those in this area know that one of the first ones to go uh, to be attacked is Fort Watson. And you will see the mural of that tomorrow. They built the tower. Uh, the British had to uh, surrender. And Green moves on Camden. Now, the Battle of Hogwarts Hill, which is the second battle of Camden, the British won, hands down. Green withdrew. Now Green always is, is, has his back to this area here in the event that Cornwallis decided to come back. And so Rodden wants to destroy Green and starts after him and then realizes Francis Marion and my horse Harry Lee have moved across the, the river and they're now at Fort Mott. And all of the supplies that Rod needs for Camden are stuck at Fort Mott. He decides to evacuate Camden and go to the relief of Fort Mott. And before he can do that, Fort Mott falls to Light Horse Harry Lee and Francis Marion. So now, for the first time, Green meets Marion. I think that would be a wonderful encounter. Green. Uh, tall, fairly statuesque, uh, very well read, reasonably well spoken, and Francis Marion, our ugly little local, uh, who has done such tremendously uh, fine work in the area. Uh, Marion had been unhappy. He wanted to quit. But after speaking with Green, he heads for this part of the area, and Marion always wants to take back Georgetown, but he gets to a <coughs> Green now, we, uh, we have uh, Orangeburg falling to Thomas Sumter, um, Grandy falling to uh, Lighthouse Harry Lee, and Green moves against 96. And he sends Andrew Pickens, Lighthouse Harry Lee, and Elijah Clark of Georgia to take back Augusta, which they do. And they build a tower and put a six pound cannon on the top of the, the uh, tower so they could fire into Fort Cornwallis. And the British saw the wisdom of surrender. And so we've now taken back all of this area and now all of this area. Francis Marion will take back Georgetown and Green is sieging 96. Rodden, uh, not able to relieve Fort Mott, takes Langhorst Harry Lee says, the most obnoxious Tories from Camden and their slaves down to Charleston, and he's ready to campaign again. Uh, Green intercepts a note from Cornwallis to Rod that they're expecting new troops from um, Ireland and that they should not disembark in Charleston but be sent right on to Virginia. But Rod never gets the message, so Green knows that those troops will stay in South Carolina. And it's part of those uh, Irish troops that Rod takes in a, in a very uh, fast march to 96. Now, this group has been in Ireland. They still have their woolen uniforms. It is in the middle of South Carolina summer, and 50 of them died of hate stroke far more casualties than 
uh, for battle. They relieve 96, Green moves off and eventually is in the Orangeburg area and Rod evacuates 96. He moves over to Orangeburg and Kruger, who evacuates 96 and gets those people to George, to uh, Charleston, he moves up to the Orangeburg area. Now, there's never a big battle in Orangeburg, in spite of the fact you have two armies within four miles of each other. But Rodden is in the brick town, and Green does not attack. And Rodden finally turns his command over to Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Stewart, because Rodden's had enough of this. He's had recurrent malaria. He's a fairly young man, but he has been sick almost all of the time that he's in South Carolina, and he decides that he is going to leave. And uh, so he moves to Charleston, where Nesbitt Balfour is the British commander. And we have the two armies up here in the Orangeburg area, and some very interesting accounts. Kirkwood talks about the fact that they are, well, they're subsisting on, subsisting on rice and frog's legs. And that there are unfortunately a lot of frogs in the Orangeburg area. And he also mentions that a few had tried alligator and found it pleasing. And if they'd stayed there much longer, a lot more of the soldiers would have learned to like alligator. Green, it's now the middle of summer. Green moves his troops over to the high hills of the Santee. And Kirkwood again writes, that his Delaware infantry has marched a thousand miles. I don't think they make men like that anymore. But anyway, uh, they're at the high hills of the San Day. Thomas Sumter, this is the dog days, and he's campaigning all over the area, uh, sometime with Francis Mary, sometimes not. Uh, William Washington's cavalry and Light Horse Harry Lee's cavalry, still in the field as well as the militia but the Continental Army is at high hills. And Green is having a terrible time getting troop replacements. While he is there, an incident happens in Charleston that will impact the war. Isaac Hayne, Colonel Isaac Hayne, is captured by the British. Well, by the South Carolina Royalists under the command of Major Thomas Frazier. And he's turned over to Rodden and Balfour in Charleston. And after what Marion thought was a mockery of a trial, they hang him very publicly in Charleston. And there's a picture of that out uh, just as you come in. Uh, it was uh, a terrible affront. Francis Marion, who usually was fairly placid, was incensed. Green urges caution because we still have very prominent South Carolinians in a prison in St. Augustine. And Green was afraid that uh, if Marion and those men committed any atrocities that the British might take it out on those other prisoners. And so he cautions Marion to wait. But Marion doesn't wait too long because the hanging of <coughs> emboldened the Tories around Charleston. And Colonel Hardin, the Patriot commander down here, was having some difficulty. And Francis Marion volunteered to go down and help him. And Green agreed. Marion left Pierce Plantation, which is down roughly where the canal is now, where he'd been encamped. 200 men on horseback, they take off in the evening, and nobody knows where they're going. Marion never told anybody what he was going to do. And those, but those men followed him. Two nights and one day later, they're 100 miles from their camp. And they're over by Jackson Borough, down in this area. And that's where Haynes Plantation is. And the family had brought Haynes back, buried him there. And now the British encampment is there. Artillery, infantry, Hessians, and the South Carolina Royalists under the command 
of Thomas Frazier. Francis Marion wanted him. Knowing that the British were headed toward Dorchester, which, by the way, is halfway between Parker's Ferry and the Just Springs, Marion sets up an ambush on the causeway to Parker's Ferry. And we have a, an excellent first-hand account from Jarvis, who was riding with the South Carolina Royalist. And he tells that they saw some riders ahead. The dragoons pulled ahead of the British column and went after the riders. They did not know that Francis Marion was in the swamp. When they were crowded on the causeway, Marion's men fired the first time. And Jarvis said they never saw a man. They just saw the smoke of the weapons. Uh, Frazier tried then to go into the swamp, but the swamp was so terribly muddy that the horses couldn't operate, so he's forced to stay on the causeway. And he's hit with a second volley, and then as he's trying to get back off the causeway, a third volley. Now, the artillery is pulled up, Marion sharpshooters kill the artillerymen. Uh, the infantry starts to move up, and Marion's men are out of ammunition, so they move across the river for about eight miles and camp. Marion never knew how many men had been killed on that causeway. He thought, in some of the records, maybe 60. But Jarvis says 125 men of the South Carolina Royalists were killed. There were 50 wounded. And Frazier was uh, had his horse shot out from underneath him. He went down on the causeway and some of the horses of his men rode over him, so he was injured, but he was not killed. So you never, there's no account of uh, Marion ever saying, well, we killed them in retaliation of pain. But Bass makes that point in his book on Thomas Sumter, that Marion spread provision against uh, the Royalist for the death of Hay uh, resulted in many, many casualties. Marion moves back and gets back to Pierce Plantation. Now Alexander Smith, uh, Stewart, who had been at, roughly at, at Fort Mott, moves down to camp at New Tusperance. And that's probably the most pleasant place you could be in August uh, in South Carolina for camp. His correspondence with Cornwallis suggests he does not believe that Green will attempt to attack without Francis Marion, and Francis Marion is down on the pond lot, which is down below Edistone. What this new commander, who just came from Ireland, does not know that Marion had a reputation of going 50 miles at night through the swamp on horseback. And Marion is no longer down the pond pond. He gets back to Pierce Plantation, has word from Green that he wants to meet him at Lawrence Plantation or Burdell's Plantation, depending on your uh, source. So Marion, who is at the same side of the river as the British Army, goes around the British camp at night with roughly 260 mounted and is never detected. It gives you an idea of how thoroughly the Patriots controlled the area toward the end. Green had moved his uh, group from the high hills, had to go clear to Camden to get across. Now, why didn't they come across Nelson's Ferry? There are two possibilities. One is that that area was flooded, and yes, it was. But Green is smarter than the average bear. There's no way he's going to cross at Nelson's Ferry.